Today at the National Press Club, the Health Minister, Mark Butler. With calls for reform to hospital funding and primary care under pressure not seen for decades, Mr Butler will outline the government's plan to strengthen Medicare. Mark Butler with today's Press Club Address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra for today's Westpac Address. My name is David Crowe and I'm the Chief Political Correspondent for the City Morning Herald and The Age and a director here at the club. Our address today is by Mark Butler, the Minister for Health and Aged Care, and it could not come at a better time. It's a pivotal moment for health policy, the government's responding to reviews on how to strengthen Medicare. It's talking to the states about primary care and hospital emergency departments. And it's dealing with GPs and pharmacists on reforming primary care. And patients can see the stress on the system when they visit the doctor and pay a gap fee on top of the Medicare rebate for the services they need. Mark Butler comes to the podium today with long experience in this policy area. He served as Minister for Ageing and he was Australia's first Minister for Mental Health in the Gillard government more than a decade ago. Before entering Parliament, he represented workers as an official at United Voice. He was also the Labor Party's national president from 2015 to 2018 and a senior vice president until this year. He attended Unley High School, the same Adelaide High School attended by Julia Gillard. I don't know what the secret is there at that high school, <laughs> but we'll f maybe we can ask about that later. And he also gained a law degree with first class honours at the University of Adelaide. You can follow the conversation on Twitter at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Before we go to the speech, I'd like to note some of the people we've got here in the audience. We have the Senior Australian of the Year for this year, 2023, Professor Tom Karma. Great to have you here. Thank you. We have Brendan Murphy, the Secretary of the Department of Health. Great to see you here. Thank you for being here. And Emma McBride, Assistant Minister in the Health Portfolio. Thank you for being here. And with that, please welcome our speaker, Mark Butler. I'm at that age where I'm not quite sure whether I need these glasses or not. <laughs> Increasingly, I do, though. Thank you, David, for that introduction. Uh, and can I acknowledge uh, at the outset the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As a nation, we truly do stand at a turning point in our relationship with First Nations people. And if there is one area where hearing from First Nations voices directly would improve outcomes, it is in health. The persistent gap in health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is proof that a voice is needed, and particularly proof that a voice should be able to make representations to the executive. <clears throat> Now, it might seem strange to start a speech on the future of Medicare by talking about the past, but to understand the future of Medicare, you just have to go back to its beginning. So, cast your mind back, if you're old enough, to 1984. Bob Hawke is the Prime Minister and Medicare is in just its first year. The Ford Falcon is Australia's best-selling car. Ghostbusters is the pinnacle of special effects. <laughs> Fax machines are in every single office and in the suburbs somewhere there is a teenager praying that his mum will buy him a Walkman for his 14th birthday. <laughs> Medicare was created to solve the problems of 1984. In those days we were younger on average and we tended not to live as long. We smoked a lot, 40% of men and 30% of women were regular smokers and our health issues were more episodic and more acute. Back then, Medicare was a symbol of modernity, but it didn't have an easy birth. Just like every other time a Labor Prime Minister had tried to introduce universal health care, we were opposed by an alliance then of the Liberal Party and doctors' associations. When Ben Chifley introduced the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme 75 years ago, he was opposed by the Liberal Party and the then British Medical Association. When Gough created Medibank 50 years ago, the Coalition and the Australian Medical Association also fought it before the Liberals dismantled it altogether. And it was the same when Bob Hawke and Neil Blewett introduced Medicare nearly 40 years ago. 
At that time, the father of the now modern Liberal Party, John Howard, described bulk billing as, quote, an absolute rort and threatened to pull Medicare right apart. And thankfully, he didn't get the chance. Medicare succeeded because it was the right reform for the health needs of Australia at the time. A fee-for-service rebate schedule that reimbursed small local doctors and specialists for the procedures they did was just what the Australia of 1984 needed. But Australia's changed, thanks in some part to the success of Medicare. Universal health care, world-leading tobacco control and a genuine revolution, particularly in cardiac health, among other innovations, mean we now live almost nine years longer than we did back then. Our health problems, though, are increasingly chronic and complex. General practice is no longer just a small cottage industry, and our health workforce is now among the best educated in the OECD. But while Australia has changed a lot, Medicare hasn't changed that much at all. That same fee-for-service model that provided rebates to local doctors in 1984 is still largely intact some 40 years later. And as the years have passed, it's frankly started to show its age. Now, let's fast forward 30 years beyond that to May 2014, nine years ago almost to the day. And a different new health minister, then from the coalition, stands at this podium and says that he wants to strengthen Medicare. The policies he puts forward seem more likely to strangle than strengthen it. $50 billion ripped out of public hospitals, a tax on every single visit to the GP for every man, woman, child and pensioner. And when Labor blocked that vandalism, he responded by freezing Medicare rebates for six long years, ripping literally billions of dollars out of general practice. Those nine long years of cuts and calculated neglect have helped precipitate the crisis that we see today. Bulk billing has declined at alarming rates. In some places, particularly rural and regional Australia, forget finding a bulk billing doctor, you struggle to find a doctor at all. Practices are closing, forcing people to drive long distances because their often corporately owned clinics are relocating and consolidating to achieve what they regard as economies of scale. And when you do manage to get in to see a GP, they're increasingly under pressure to move quickly on to the next patient, which isn't good for you and isn't what they train to do. All this puts real pressure on our hospitals because too many conditions are going untreated and become increasingly serious. The case for reform I think everyone accepts now is urgent. We can't keep trying to treat 21st century Australia with a 1980s Medicare. In the first six months of our government, I chaired the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. Around that table were representatives from the College of GPs, the AMA, the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Founder Association, um, Allied Health and Rural Professionals, First Nations Perspectives, and very importantly, patient perspectives through the Consumers Health Forum, along with a range of other experts. I am a firm believer in the value of this kind of direct stakeholder engagement by ministers. Health, as we in this room all know, is a sector full of very hard-working, highly skilled stakeholders. But they have sharp elbows, they have loud voices, and they don't always agree, to put it kindly. But over the six months that I sat around that table, I have to say, what I heard was a remarkable degree of goodwill, but also agreement on the direction that reform should take. And at National Cabinet last Friday, the Prime Minister unveiled the important first measures of the government's response. $2.2 billion worth of critical reforms that help build a stronger Medicare. The Treasurer will give a full accounting of the dollars and cents behind those investments in the budget next week, as well, I stress, as other initiatives that are still to be announced. But today I want to outline just how those reforms knit together and build a stronger Medicare that is fit for the 21st century, underpinned by three foundational changes. First, digital systems that drive better care. We simply cannot build a stronger Medicare without better realising the opportunities that digital health technologies open up for more efficient and collaborative health care. <coughs> Excuse me. 
The former government had so little commitment to digital health that it couldn't even be f bothered funding my health record beyond the 30th of June this year. Seriously, on July 1, my health record was due to be switched off. Unplugged, gone. Time for doctors everywhere to dust off those 1980s fax machines, which wouldn't be too difficult for some of them who are still, <laughs> frankly, using them. In contrast, this budget will include over $950 million worth of investment in digital health, including funding to make the Digital Health Agency an ongoing entity, it too would have closed on the 30th of June, and to upgrade my health record. My health record is now old technology, still uses the old PDF format that Labor installed when we were last in government. That was cutting edge then, but it's clunky now. For starters, it needs to be more compatible with the information and billing systems that practitioners are already using. It should provide better connections between different parts of our health system and make it much easier for people to access and securely share their own data. Right now, only one in ten specialists use my health record. Just one in five diagnostic reports in radiology are uploaded. The other four just disappear into the digital ether. Patients find this so frustrating because every lost test result means another day off work, another waiting room, another procedure and usually yet another gap fee. A complete waste of time and money for patients and for the health system. If a patient gets a diagnostic scan or a pathology test, then those results should be uploaded. The moment this happens by exception rather than rule. I say now, I intend to make it a rule. The second foundational change in a stronger Medicare is to enable a much more multidisciplinary and team-based approach to primary health care. We all know in this room chronic conditions are the leading cause of illness today, leading cause of disability and death. Treating them effectively needs more than just the occasional sporadic visit to the doctor. Patients with chronic conditions need a coordinated team of health workers proactively working together with them for their long-term health. This includes GPs, allied health, nurses, specialists and everything in between. Which means primary care providers need support and investment to engage a broad range of health professionals to provide that more comprehensive care. This government is delivering just that by providing a big increase to the workforce incentive payment that general practices use to hire different health professionals to join their team, in particular practice nurses. For smaller practices and in thin markets, primary health networks will be funded to commission allied health professionals like social workers, physios, diabetes educators or mental health nurses. But it's become increasingly clear that a Medicare built solely on the old fee-for-service model of the 80s just doesn't address our needs or suit our times. A Medicare benefit schedule that is nearly 6,000 items long is proof of that. When it launched 40 years ago, there were barely more than 2,000 items on the schedule. Now it is hugely complex. Some find it so complex that they underbill. Others incorrectly overbill, despite their best efforts. The time has come to develop new funding models that supplement fee-for-service. And it begins this year with the launch of something called My Medicare. General practices will be able to register with My Medicare so that patients can register with their preferred GP at that practice. And over time, My Medicare will also be extended to nurse practitioners and to other primary care providers. Patients will gain a stronger relationship with their healthcare teams and will get access to more consistent care, including longer telehealth consultations under Medicare. Providers will get access to new funding packages and more information about their regular patients so that they can provide more tailored care to those patients. My Medicare will be open to everyone and will be entirely voluntary. And the benefits of this system-wide reform will grow over time as more patients and more providers join. But the true power of My Medicare is not what it is, but what it allows. My Medicare is the foundation upon which we can build a range of blended funding models to better serve the needs of patients that too often are falling through the cracks of the 1980s Medicare system. There are more than, for example, 13,000 patients that present to hospital 10 or more times each year. 
These are people with complex, chronic conditions that aren't getting the comprehensive team-based care that they need to stay healthy and to stay out of hospital. Through my Medicare, these patients will be identified along with help from the states and the GP that they register with will receive incentive payments to deliver the tailored care that they need to stay healthy and out of hospital. It's the kind of program that has been sorely lacking in Australia and one that Medicare of the 1980s simply couldn't deliver. It blends fee-for-service with patient-centred funding so that doctors can spend more time doing what they train for and health teams get the support to provide long-term care, not just piecemeal funding for the procedures that they perform. Because if COVID-19 taught us anything, it's that our people, our health professionals, are our health system's greatest asset. <coughs> Excuse me again. That's why the third and most important foundational change, I think, is to grow, support and invest in the incredible health workforce that Australia already has. Our highly educated and trusted nurses and midwives in particular can play a much bigger role in primary care. Next week's budget will include funding for up to 6,000 nursing students to do clinical placements in primary care services right around the country, as well as funding to support 500 enrolled and registered nurses to return to the profession. There are 450,000 registered nurses and midwives in Australia when we want them to be at the forefront of reforms to primary care. But at the moment, Medicare simply doesn't do enough to encourage or to enable them, or many other health professions for that matter, to provide that care. Even if they have the training and the expertise to deliver the care that a patient needs, they're often held back by a complex maze of regulations and funding programs as well as territorial silos. And we need to ask the question, how does that meet the needs of 21st century Australia? The government will commission, in consort with state governments, a review of scope of practice to ask and answer that question. We simply cannot build a collaborative primary care system or support pr practitioners to work autonomously unless we are prepared to get rid of the red tape and the outdated silos that prevent team-based care. That goes not just for nurses and midwives and allied health, but for pharmacists as well. People tell me time and time again that over the course of this pandemic, there has been no more accessible health setting than their local pharmacy. Pharmacists have already administered more than 10 million COVID vaccinations. They administered two out of every five vaccines just last week. From next year, Australians will be able to walk into community pharmacies and get safe and convenient access to all of the vaccines on the National Immunisation Program free of charge. Australians battling through opioid dependency will soon also get the affordable and subsidised treatment that they need at their local pharmacy as well. Together, just these two programs mean a nearly $500 million investment by this government in community pharmacies over the next five years. A stronger Medicare means growing the health workforce while removing the red tape that prevents our highly skilled nurses, midwives, pharmacists and all the other health professionals we have in this country from providing every ounce of care that they can. Because that will also free up our doctors to focus more on the complex conditions that only they can treat. These three foundational reforms will make Medicare stronger, but remaking Medicare for the 21st century will take persistent evolution, not overnight revolution. It took nine years of cuts and neglect to bring Medicare to the current weakened state we find it in, and it's going to take time again to strengthen it. But I make this promise to you today. With every gradual foundational change that we make, we will put the needs of patients first. As we take the hard choices, I fully expect that some will oppose them, just like the Liberal Party opposed Medicare in the 80s, Medibank in the 70s and the PBS in the 40s. Change is scary, I understand that, because with change comes risk. But the risk of not changing this system is far greater. We can't keep trying to treat 21st century Australia with a 1980s Medicare system. So we'll listen to all the good arguments and the evidence about the way forward. But our North Star, our Lodestar, 
will always be what is good for Australians. Because at the end of the day, as we all know in this room, Medicare is for people. Today and tomorrow. It was in 84, it is in 2024, and I hope it will be in 2064. And before finishing, I'd just like to turn to one other area of important reform, and that is vaping. When Medicare was getting underway uh, 40 years ago, the biggest public health challenge in Australia was undoubtedly tobacco. So I said 40% of men and 30% of women were regular smokers. And we've done really well on that count. We should be proud. Today, only around 10% of Australian adults smoke. The progress that we've made is, thanks, I have to say, in large part, to the efforts of successive Labor health ministers, particularly my friend and former senior minister, Nicola Roxon, who introduced our world-leading plain packaging reforms. In November last year, on the 10-year anniversary of those laws, I announced our government's intention to build on that legacy and to implement the next generation of tobacco control. But unfortunately, the gains that we have made in tobacco could be undone by a new threat to public health. Vaping was sold to governments and to communities all around the world as a therapeutic product to help long-term smokers quit. It was not sold as a recreational product, and in particular, not one for our kids. But that is what it's become, the biggest loophole, I think, in Australian healthcare history. One in six um, teenagers aged 14 to 17 has vaped. One in four young Australians aged 18 to 24 has also vaped. Only one in 70 my age has vaped. And when more than a thousand teenagers aged 15 to 17 were asked where they could get vapes, four in five of them said local retail, in retail stores. This is a product deliberately targeted at our kids, being sold alongside lollies and chocolate bars. Vaping has now become the number one behavioural issue in high schools and it's becoming widespread in primary schools as well. Over the past 12 months, Victoria's Poisons Hotline has taken 50 calls about children under the age of four ingesting vapes. Under the age of four. Vapes contain more than 200 chemicals that do not belong in the lungs. Some of the same chemicals you'll find in nail polish remover and weed killer. Just like they did with smoking, let's be very clear about this. Big Tobacco has taken another addictive product, wrapped it in shiny packaging, added sweet flavours to create a new generation of nicotine addicts. Young vapors are three times as likely to take up smoking, so it is no wonder that under 25s are the only cohort in our population that are seeing smoking rates actually increase. This has to end. This must end. To his credit, the former health minister, Greg Hunt, tried to put border controls in place, but there was a revolt in his party room and that regulation was overturned in two weeks. Instead, the former government ended up creating the perfect conditions for this unregulated, essentially illegal market to flourish right before our eyes in convenience stores, tobacconists, vape shops, sometimes deliberately set up down the road from their target market, local schools. A so-called prescription model with next to no prescriptions, a ban with no real enforcement, an addictive product with no support to quit. Over summer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, consulted health groups and our community, and they provided us with a clear roadmap. The first thing to do is to stop the import of vapes that are not destined for pharmacy shelves to be sold as a therapeutic product with the approval of a health professional. To obtain an import permanent, an importer will have to show that the vapes that they propose to sell comply with new standards and processes established by the TGA. They will have to be imported for sale only in pharmacies. The import of vapes for sale in retail settings will end. These are supposed to be pharmaceutical products, so they will have to present that way. No more bubblegum flavours, no more pink unicorns, no more, no more vapes deliberately disguised as highlighter pens for kids to be able to hide them in their pencil cases. Instead, we'll have pharmaceutical style packaging and devices with plain flavours. I also intend to accept the TGA's advice and ban single-use 
disposable vapes that clog landfill and have become toxic to our environment. Obviously, to make this work, we need the assistance of state and territory governments to close down the sale of vapes outside pharmacies, in convenience stores and the like. But I know that my colleagues at state and territory level are just as committed as I am to stamping out this public health menace with a strong national coordinated response. We also all recognise though that there is still a therapeutic use for vapes in the right circumstances to help long-term smokers quit or perhaps now also to assist in nicotine addiction that has been caused by vapes themselves. But a script is really hard to come by. Only one in 20 doctors are authorised by the TGA to prescribe vapes to those who need it. And we think this has to change. It will require removing the restrictions on doctors prescribing so that all doctors can write a script for those who really need it. Governments will also consider whether other proper therapeutic pathways should be examined to allow patients to obtain vapes through a pharmacy where they need them because a whole new generation of Australians will need support to quit their new nicotine dependency. And they won't be alone in their quest to kick the habit. Next week's budget will include $30 million for support programs to help Australians quit and $63 million for a national evidence-based information campaign with a particular emphasis on young people. And as we stamp out the growing black market in illegal vaping, we also need to prevent young people from trading their vapes for cigarettes, which is why this budget will also include measures to bring smoking rates down, to protect people from taking it up and additional support for current and former smokers to look after their health. Today I announced that tax on tobacco will be increased by 5% per year over the next three years starting on September 1st because we know that a higher priced cigarette is a more unattractive cigarette. We will also align the tax treatment of tobacco products so that products like roll your own tobacco and manufactured sticks are taxed equally. Together these changes will raise an additional $3.3 billion over the coming four years, including $290 million in GST payments to the states and territories, helping to support our health system and the health of current and former smokers and vapors. More than $260 million will be invested in a new national lung cancer screening program that will prevent more than 4,000 deaths from lung cancer. At-risk Australians will be able to get a lung scan every two years as recommended by the Independent Medical Services Advisory Committee. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in Australia and we know that First Nations communities carry an even higher burden when it comes to rates both of smoking and of cancer, such that cancer is now the leading cause of disease-related death for First Nations people. The budget will also include, therefore, nearly $240 million to address this inequity, with funding to ensure mainstream cancer services are culturally safe and accessible to First Nations people, as well as funding to build the capacity and the capability of the Aboriginal com community controlled health services sector to support cancer on the ground. And the successful Tackling Indigenous Smoking program, overseen by a wonderful Senior Australian of the Year, Tom Karma, will be extended and will also be widened to reduce vaping among First Nations people as well as smoking. Friends, health ministers are unanimous in their commitment to work together on vaping and tobacco control. Just yesterday, we all agreed to work urgently together to develop the comprehensive, coordinated suite of regulations to make this plan work, because we will not stand by and allow vaping to create another generation of nicotine addicts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for that speech. I think it got a very good reception in this room. I think the idea of uh, gaining $3.3 in revenue over four years seems to have been re well received here. Um, so we've got breaking news from the uh, National Press Club. Uh, 
We have about more than a dozen journalists here to ask you questions, but I thought I would kick off with a question that actually connects with the savings measure that you've just announced. Um, 3.3 billion over four years from um, a higher excise on tobacco. Um, oh, I'm going to break a rule here. I'm going to ask two questions. <laughs> Firstly, is that it's just a simple one? Is that all going back into Medicare? And a related one. Before our broadcast today, we had a series of health awards. The health award for this year, the top award, went to Adele Ferguson and Chris Gillette for a series on fraud in Medicare. And I know that you then commissioned a task force that looked at fraud in Medicare. Um, it reported back with an estimate that 1.5 to 3 billion a year is lost in fraud. Uh, given we're a week out from the budget, should we expect any action in the budget that addresses fraud in order to recover money and then to reinvest that in Medicare? Thank you, David. Very undisciplined start Sorry. to the proceedings with two questions. Um, to your second first, uh, Pradeep Phillip conducted a, a very thorough, relatively quick review for us. We're still working through that. As I've said publicly, some of the recommendations from Mr Phillip would be relatively easy to implement, relatively quick. Some of them, frankly, are incredibly complex and will take some time to work through. Uh, we're, we're looking through those recommendations and we'll give a response in due course. And um, there's obviously more, as I said, <coughs> to come in the budget next week around Medicare, and I'm, I'm pretty much at my limit as to what uh, I've, I've pre-announced. Um, on your first question, though, I'm really proud of the fact that, that uh, so much of this excise that will be raised will be reinvested into health. Not absolutely every dollar will be, but, th but there are very substantial health programs that are going to be able to be reinvested, including, for example, the lung cancer screening program, because we're taking this measure. Just if I, I might just recap for people, under the last government, tobacco excise increased by well over 100% during their term in government. We're proposing three five percent increases. Um, excise had stopped uh, increasing in about 2020, and since that time, excise increases have actually started to lag inflation, particularly last year. So we're determined not to see the price of cigarettes start to be become more attractive as against CPI. We've got to continue to send that price signal that Nicola Roxon uh, argued so persuasively, so comprehensively, 10 years. And there is the benefit, obviously, that we're able to use some of that revenue to invest in these important health programs. Thank you. And uh, I, I, before we go on, I should know... Third question. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. I would not dare. Um, I just want to note that you can hear uh, the Minister's voice is, uh, he's losing a little bit of his voice. He's been doing major addresses and also a bunch of interviews, so bear with us on that. If you need to take a break, just, just let us know. Um, our next question is from Tom Connell. Thanks, Crowley and Minister. I'll note Port played on Friday in quite a close game as well, so that could be another reason for <laughs> the voice. How do we go? I think we won. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure we won, Tom. Yeah, but you, you got him over the line. Um, <laughs> It's great to be here in a full room, I'll note. Not so long ago under COVID restrictions, these lunches were sort of 12 masked journalists, not a bread roll in sight. And <laughs> Morris was doing his best, but it was a pretty sad state of affairs. Um, COVID smashed, obviously, hospitality. It changed our lives. It locked us down. People couldn't get back into the country. Um, some people couldn't visit dying relatives. Hundreds of billions of dollars under debt. I don't need to go on. We know what it did. We still don't have a definitive report on what was worth it, why decisions were taken. And when asked about a Royal Commission, Anthony Albanese has said several times, and he's been in power a little while now, that we're dealing with COVID now and that's our priority. But experts say we could be dealing with it <coughs> forever. So what sort of time frame are we really waiting for? What's the trigger? When will you be able to, your government be able to announce a Royal Commission on COVID? Well, <coughs> we, we, we said before the election, I've said since, that just given the enormous dislocation, stress, death um, and expenditure involved in this pandemic, it would be extraordinary not to have a very thorough inquiry into it, and that remains our position, um, particularly through the course of last year and summer, where there were significant waves that posed a lot of stress on health systems and communities. We didn't think that was the right time to announce that. We're giving consideration to this question. We'll have more to say about it in the future. Our next question is from Sue Dunleavy. Uh, Minister, you took us on a, a bit of a history tour in your speech. Sorry, I'm losing my voice as well. It's catching. Um, 
you, you've, you've decided to introduce a new My Medicare program as part of your reforms in the budget. This will allow wraparound care of people. When he was Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd introduced a program for diabetes patients that paid doctors $1,200 a year to provide wraparound care. Doctors wouldn't have a bar of it, it failed. Uh, the previous Health Minister, Greg Hunt, introduced healthcare homes, same idea. Doctors were given a budget to provide wraparound care for patients. It also failed and a review found it didn't actually improve patient outcomes. What is more magical about your solution and how much is a doctor going to get paid to provide that wraparound care? What is the budget per patient under your program? Well, the, as I said, the costings of that will become clear after next Tuesday night. I mean, I think uh, the, the diabetes care pilot that we conducted when we were last in government um, had some very good results. It was agreed, I agree, it was contested at the time. Uh, and some of the different pilots that have taken place since, including the healthcare homes pilot conducted under the former government, also had mixed results. In the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, we looked very carefully at all of that. Uh, and we looked at the work that had been conducted to develop the 10-year primary care plan that was released in the former government's last budget. And there was, I think, a striking degree of consensus that has now built up around the need for some of these bundled or more flexible funding models to sit on top of fee-for-service. I think a much greater degree of consensus than there certainly was when we were last in government. So I'm, I'm confident we'll get the costings right. I'm confident, given the soundings we've had with AMA with the College of GPs and many others besides, that there is a real appetite out there to step into this sort of new future for Medicare. It is a very different one, which is why I think it will take time to build. We're not in a rush to do it. We want to get it right because I think the Grattan Institute said that we've had more pilots than Qantas over the past <laughs> 10 or 20 years, and they were right on that. And, and I think everyone's done with more pilots. I think, I think we, we, we want to see some systemic change that's built at a steady, sure rate, learning as we go. I'm confident that's what we're doing. Our next question is from Monique Pueblos from SBS. And I mentioned the Journalism Awards earlier. Monique was one of those uh, award winners. Congratulations, Monique. Thank you. So yes, Monique Pueblos, SBS Insight. Um, you mentioned squashing the black market on vapes, but although nicotine vapes are prescription only in Australia, the black market is thriving. Given the, given the history of prohibition, does the government have any concerns that the ban will only make this issue worse? Well, <clears throat> I don't think, um, Rachel Stephen Smith is here, the ACT health minister. We had a terrific discussion yesterday as a group of health ministers, determined to do this, um, determined to do it urgently but under no illusion about the challenge. I mean, this thing has flourished in front of our eyes. Uh, we, all, we all know this if we interact as parents or uncles and aunties in whatever way with, with young school students, that it is, it is just flourished, particularly over the course of COVID. And so we're going to have to shut down an, in, an industry, a market that, that has been allowed to grow up in spite of the fact that it wasn't really supposed to. I mean, the, the prescription model meant that this wasn't supposed to happen. State and territory governments very rightly say, what are they supposed to do if the borders are open, if there's no import control? On this, I said Greg Hunt, to his credit, tried to do this. I think he was very well-intentioned. I, I think he saw the risk that was ahead of us, um, but his party room didn't let him do it. Um, we're going to have very strong controls on the borders. We're going to resource that properly. We're going to sit down with state and territory governments to make sure we get the resourcing right, both at the border, but also on the ground with state and territory authorities going out and checking that these convenience stores aren't breaking the law because that is what they will be doing. So we're under no illusion about how hard this is, but we've got a real sense from the community, certainly from the health sector, that you know, we've got to deal with this now. Um, this, is, this is a moment to shut down a major health risk to the youngest generation of Australians. After doing so much work over so many decades, and many people in this room have been a part of it, to drive down smoking as the biggest killer of Australians, the idea that we would, that we would just let a new generation of risk, creating a new generation of nicotine addicts, go untouched is just beyond us. So it'll be tough, but we are determined to do it. Thank you. Next question is from Tom McElroy. 
Thanks for your speech, Minister. Thanks for taking our questions. The Treasurer regularly cites health and aged care as two of the biggest pressures on the federal budget, along with repaying debt, the growth in the NDIS, defence, things like that. Is that inevitable going forward in an ageing society like Australia? Or will there be changes to spending in the health portfolio to manage that in a better way? Well, both. Uh, it's not an either or. Uh, there are some areas, I mean, aged care, we know is simply a product of demographics. Um, you know, we, we've, we've known for years, if not decades, that the ageing of the baby boomer generation and then every generation after them, because they're all big, my generation's bigger than the baby boomer generation, is going to mean additional costs. And you invest in that in the same way that during a baby boom itself, you invest in schools. This is the right and proper thing to do. So to an extent, there, of course, is going to be an inexorable rise in the costs associated with supporting a generation that worked hard, paid their taxes, raised their families and built this community. Uh, and, and we should just recognise the reality of that. The intergenerational report that comes out later this year will set out some of those numbers again to refresh our understanding of it. But, but yes, I mean, this is inevitable in the ageing space. But we've got to make sure we spend the money right. We've got to make sure that, that we get the sustainable, a sustainable mix um, about, about who is funding this. Uh, that's something we're, we're giving consideration to now. In the broader health space, I think if you look at PBS, for example, after the pricing reforms that were put in place 15 years ago, um, the sort of the, the expectation 20 years ago that PBS was going to overwhelm the budget just hasn't come to pass. So growth in the PBS is relatively modest. Growth in the MBS, the Medicare benefit schedule, has been relatively modest. Growth in health that, that is substantial is in hospitals. Mm. And so, obviously, we're talking with states about that. We've got a mid-term review of the hospital funding agreement that's just kicked off. All of us want to make sure that every dollar we spend in health is spent wisely. Um, we've got to look out for inefficient, you know, non-productive uses of scarce health funding and make sure that it's being used in the best way. But I think in a whole lot of areas of health, we've managed to control spending pretty well. In some areas, particularly associated with ageing, there is going to be an inexorable rise in in per capita spending for an older population. But again, we've got to make sure that that's done smartly. Our next question is from Natasha Robinson from The Australian, also commended earlier in the Health Journalism Awards. Congratulations, Natasha. Thanks very much, Hi, Minister. Um, you've talked a lot since you've been Minister about the crisis in general practice, how it's never been harder to see a doctor, that people are paying more gap fees than ever. Um, how will this package um, that you're announcing in the budget and the reforms that you're instituting over the next few years solve the fundamental problem that the rebate is now so low that it just doesn't, you know, cover the cost anywhere near it, it, the actual cost of seeing a doctor? And also, you know, it causes the problem you've also talked about about a lack of attractiveness in going into the professions. Uh, while your reforms are, are really welcome, aren't you going to be still left with this problem um, going forward, at least in the next few years? Thanks, Natasha. I, I tried to stress that there's more in the budget in health. There's more in the budget that reflects our strengthening Medicare agenda. Um, the, the issues that, or the items that the Prime Minister took to National Cabinet were items that, that we thought would be um, a productive discussion between state and territories. Often we'll want their cooperation, for example, in the identification of the frequent flyers in hospitals. So there is more to come. We're very conscious of the financial pressure that particularly general practice is under. I've talked a lot about that. And um, we, we've been thinking very carefully through ways in which we can alleviate that financial pressure. We can't undo sort of several years of Medicare rebate freeze in one fell swoop. That's difficult, obviously. But this is our most important priority. I've said that from the time I was appointed as Health Minister. I have no higher priority than rebuilding general practice. It's part of relieving some of that pressure today. But as you point out, and you've written about this, Natasha, it's also a part of, about rebuilding the attractiveness of general practice as a career for our young medical graduates. You know the stats, 14% of medical graduates now are choosing to go into general practice. Um, it used to be 50%. So if you think it's hard to get a GP now, five, ten years down the track, if we haven't turned that around, 
we're going to be in all sorts of difficulty. And the general practice being the backbone of our healthcare system means that that would reverberate right through the broader health system, particularly into our hospitals. So we will have a comprehensive look at this. Um, I think improving the attractiveness of general practice for young medical graduates. I've talked to a lot of young doctors through the AMA, through the college, um, just anecdotally, is not just about money. I mean, it's, yes, it is about money a bit. It's also about culture. It's also about the respect that, that, um, that general practice attracts from their governments, but also others in the health sector, including, frankly, some of their supervising physicians in hospitals. So we're going to have to look at this quite comprehensively. But rest assured that there is no higher priority for me than rebuilding general practice, because it is in the worst state, certainly, I think it's been in, in the 40-year history of Medicare. The next question is from Andrew Brown. Andrew Brown from AAP. Thanks for your speech, Minister. How would you consider the changes to vaping to be successful? Would they be contingent on smoking rates to go down to levels they were before vaping was more pronounced? Would it be um, a decline in vaping the same levels as cigarettes among the broader population? Would it only be among young people or would it be vaping stopping altogether? Well, I want vaping to return to the, the purpose that we were said it was invented for, and that is a therapeutic product to help um, long-term smokers quit. We, we were promised this was a pathway out of smoking, not a pathway into smoking. And that's what it's become, and that's what it so, so shamelessly has been sold as and, and presented as like vapes deliberately disguised as highlighter pens so that kids can hide them in, in their pencil case and and smoke them at school or vape them at school. Um, this is the most shameless piece of marketing that I've seen in my time, uh, particularly in the health sector. And, and if I've got a key indicator, it is to stamp out the idea that this is a recreational product at all, but particularly a recreational product for our kids. So knocking that market out is what I'm aiming for. Now, of course, uh, we also want to see smoking rates continue to come down. We want to see smoking rates plateau and then come down in that crucial under 25 cohort as well, which is why there are very substantial investments in that, including for the first time in many years, a funded tobacco information campaign that will be particularly focused on young people. Our next question is from Natasia Krasanthos. Hi, thanks Minister for your address, Natasia from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Going back to general practice, um, you've discussed a bunch of measures today that will inject more funds into GP, such as the after hours um, funding, the workplace incentive program, um, the My Medicare system, and reading between the lines of your answer earlier, there will also be some form of Medicare rebate increase for general practitioners in the budget. Um, should Australians therefore expect to see a rise in bulk billing rates and a decline in the average gap fee they pay? Um, at what point should they be able to see that measure and going or that outcome? And going back to your opening remarks where you mentioned the increasing corporate ownership of general practice, which is another structural force at play, um, if there is an increase in Medicare rebates for GPs, how will you ensure that this is passed on to the consumer and that gap fees don't stay where they are um, or continue to grow? Yeah, we're obviously very focused on that. If there is going to be investment in, in this to make sure that it ends up benefiting patients directly, um, you know, I've, I've said publicly since before we were elected um, how concerned I was at what was happening to the bulk billing rates. I don't think that was coming through the data that was being published by the former government. But as we've worked with my department, with Brendan, to, to get a sort of slightly different type of data being presented to the public, it's become very clear. What patients had been telling us, what doctors had been telling us, is real. Bulk billing is in very substantial decline. There are some communities where it's really hard to find a bulk billing doctor, including here, I think, in the ACT. Other communities, for example, Western Sydney, South Western Sydney, where it's still relatively common. So it's, it's hard to sort of explain why there are such differences in different parts of the country. But probably at the top of my list of concerns, is the decline in bulk billing. And what we've seen over the last 12 months or so increasingly, particularly as stories about pensioners, concession card holders, also now being charged a gap fee. I mean, that is a profound change um, to the way in which I think we understand 
the access and affordability of primary care services. So those, those really are the things that have been shaping our thinking, but you're going to have to wait till next Tuesday night. <laughs> next question is from Paul Karp. Thanks very much for your speech, Minister. Um, under this framework where it would be uh, illegal for an adult to buy a vape without a prescription uh, but not a cigarette, I just want to ask the long-term policy direction. Is that an inconsistency that you plan on addressing by banning smoking or by phasing out smoking by birth year as they're doing in New Zealand? We've got no plans to do that. I, I also particularly, this might be a minor nuance, but it's important for me. Our focus is not on the people buying, our focus is on the people selling. Yeah, this, is, this has been a vendor-driven, corporate-driven um, phenomenon that we've seen. And so when we talk about enforcement, the state and territory governments and, and us, we're focused very much on importers and vendors, not on, not on the customer themselves. We want to knock out the market. We're not blaming the customers. Uh, we're, not, we're not blaming them. They've been sold a pup. We've all been sold a pup. Frankly, we've been duped. And so the difference, I think, between vaping and cigarettes is, is that cigarettes have been with us for so long. You know, if we knew now, back then, when cigarettes were being introduced, I would hope that governments would have stopped it, would have snuffed it out immediately, which is what I want to do to vapes. You know, we have a closing window here before vapes become so widespread so accepted, so normalised, as frankly some would want them to be, the National Party, for example, that it would be very, very difficult to take any action. Uh, but I'm still confident that, that the thing is still relatively new and we are going to be able to take the action that I've outlined today. So no differential... Uh... No, no plans to, to do what New Zealand has done at this stage. Thank you. And the next question is from Claudia Long. Hi, Minister. Claudia Long, ABC. Thank you for your address. Uh, in 2019, Labor committed to linking hospital funding to the provision of abortion to make sure terminations were accessible and free. Um, as you know, that's since been dropped from your platform. So I'm interested to know what specifically has it been replaced with and, you know, to make sure that this service is accessible. And also, should patients expect to see something around this in next week's budget or will they need to wait longer than that? Well, we're, we're still very committed as a matter of principle to equitable access across the country uh, to reproductive health and termination services. Um, it's a particular issue in rural and regional Australia, uh, in some states more than others. So this is something we're focused on. We've had a discussion from time to time as health ministers about. Uh, in the federal parliament, there is a Senate inquiry, I think, as you would know, into these issues. And we've, this, this has been an inquiry that's been very well received out in the community, a lot of interest, a lot of submissions, some public hearings. So we're looking forward to the results of that inquiry and we'll consider those recommendations. And is that when you plan to make a concrete, I guess, plan to improve access? Because, I mean, as you know, it's a big problem. It's legal, certainly, but accessible, inaccessible for many people. And you had a concrete solution before and it seems like there's a bit of a, not a gap there, but I think people are interested to know. So are you waiting on that inquiry to then make a decision? Sure, and I remind, um, state and territory services are primarily responsible for this, or governments are primarily responsible for, um, for these services, uh, and I know that there, there is activity underway at state and territory level, but yes, we're, we think the proper thing to do is to wait the outcome of that inquiry, consider the recommendations, and we'll provide a response in that time. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Michelle Slater. Hi, I'm really not quite convinced of that answer you gave um, before about compliance. When any of us here can walk into any smoke, smokes shop and buy unregulated, under-the-counter chop-chop. So, um, when I raised this question with a friend of mine who is a vapor, he just said, OK, they'll just sell it under-the-counter unregulated or I'll just buy my vape juice online. So how can we guarantee that a similar situation is not going to happen as we're seeing with the illegal durries trade? And why not sell it for over 18s regulated and taxed over the counter with the other smokes? Well, because I'm not going to normalise a product that, that is deliberately designed, in my view, to create a new generation of nicotine addicts that, that evidence shows is becoming a pathway back into smoking, to, to smoking cigarettes. I'm just not going to do it. There's no health argument, no public health argument for that. And frankly, the, the under-the-counter sale of these things is not something that might happen in the future. It's happening right now. 
but it's happening in a way that effectively has no compliance or enforcement activity behind it. Because I think state and territory governments quite rightly say, well, you at a Commonwealth level have just let the border open. You've just you've let them come in. So we're going to do what I think we need to do, close the border, put in place compliance resources through Border Force, um, the TGA, and we'll be making our position clear on that in due course, but work cooperatively with state and territory governments to get that important compliance and enforcement activity happening at a grassroots level in retail settings. So now, as to Chop Chop, um, which you talked about as well, we do recognise that this is also a loophole in all of the regulation we've put in place, particularly the pricing signals around tobacco. And as part of our excise measure, we're committed to working more with sort of some of the enforcement mechanisms we had at a federal level, including the ATO, but also with state and territory governments in trying to reduce that. I recognise that's hard. And they don't come in in shipping containers labelled Chop Chop or vapes for that matter. Um, this, is, this is hard work we're expecting of our policing authorities and border force people, but we're determined it's something we simply have to do. When you look at this regime and you talk to the states and territories about how to set it up, do you want criminal sanctions against retailers who sell and flout the rules that you want to bring in? Is that something that you want the states and territories to do because primarily enforcement would be up to them? Well, I mean, there will be activity we have to put in place, particularly around borders and imports, but there will be activity that we expect states and territories will have to um, undertake as well. We had a good discussion about that yesterday. Uh, yesterday, all the health ministers tasked our officials at all jurisdictional levels to commence work immediately on what that comprehensive regulatory framework will look like. Now, what penalties look like and all those sorts of things uh, will be a matter for that sort of work. And, uh, we want that to be put in place urgently. OK. Uh, next question is from Nick Stewart. You made the important point when you began that, that Medicare was a terrific system when introduced, but it's now 40 years later. W w at this stage, do we actually need to stop considering... You, you made the point that there's a shrinking number of GPs. Do we actually, rather than reinforcing the Medicare system, which relies on the GP as the first step in the health system, do we need to actually re-envisage it so that in your local shops you actually go to a medical centre where there is uh, not merely a doctor but also a physiotherapist, also psychological assistants, also a pharmaceutical person, uh, so that that way it's all an integrated approach? Well, increasingly, I think the market has set up these one-stop shops, uh, much more than you remember, Nick, when 40 years ago, when, when general practices were very small, cottage industries, only a couple of GPs may be working there and you'd have to go to completely different premises to access some I, of those services. So, I do remember that, but that's a bit rude to say that... Oh, uh... I remember it too. <laughs> it was a question of solidarity between us, <laughs> Nick. Um, you know, I think the market is setting that up because that's what patients want and, frankly, it's what patients need, that joined-up care. And here in the ACT, there's the terrific example of nurse-led clinics that have been very successful. I mean, they were contested. They were hard, I know, for the ACT government under then Katie Gallagher to set up, but they've proven their worth in terms of avoided hospital admissions, avoided general practice presentations. So what I also said in my speech, I think, is although general practice is utterly central to the functioning of a proper healthcare system, we can get much more out of our healthcare professionals, out of nurses, out of nurse practitioners, out of pharmacists and other health professionals as well. And, and that really is something that I think uh, we're all committed to doing, and fr frankly, including the doctor representatives who are on the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Maurice Riley, Chief Executive here at the it, club. It's really from Tim Shaw, who's watching, eagerly watching. Uh, Minister, what are you going to do to help rural Australia that has the highest levels of medical workforce shortages and some of the biggest numbers of long-term chronic health issues? Well, this has been, um, this has been a challenge for, for as long as we've had a healthcare system in Australia. Uh, in ways, that it's getting easier because there are telehealth connections that people are able to use that, to a degree, close down that tyranny of distance. When we came to government, we promised, for example, to restore the rural loading for telehealth sessions for psychiatrists that I put in place when I was Minister for Mental Health more than a decade ago. Uh, that's a really important way for people to be able to get psychiatry support 
if they're living in communities that simply don't have a psychiatrist. But I'm particularly very clear and cognizant that, that access to standard general practice services is even harder in rural and regional Australia than some of the challenges we've talked about existing in our cities. We have a strong incentives, incentives program for people to go and work as GPs in rural and regional communities. Indeed, in October, we increased some of those incentives. We're trying to put in place different models to really broaden the pipeline of young GPs who want to train and then work in rural and regional Australia. Some terrific innovations that we announced down in Tasmania, a single employer model. So someone's employed by a hospital, able to work in general practice while they train. We're confident that will improve the pipeline as well. But look, there's much, much more that I think we need to do. The representatives of rural and regional medicine who are on the Strengthening Medicare Task Force were very clear that some of these models that might work in cities are still going to be a challenge in rural and regional Australia and we're going to, going to have to continue to do work on that. Thank you. And the last question is from Tom Connell. I get two. Um, <laughs> just noting your 60-day prescription policy, the medicines policy, you noted that it brought Australia up to speed with the UK and New Zealand. Uh, after those policies, though, in the UK, an estimated 1,100 pharmacies shut. In New Zealand, it was 70. Has your department done any work to see how many pharmacies could close in Australia? And will you be monitoring the situation if they're starting to shut or threatening to, to be able to step in and avoid that happening? Well, of course, we're going to monitor that very closely. Um, I also said when I announced this that uh, we would be reinvesting every single dollar that the Commonwealth taxpayer saves through this measure. It's substantial. It's about $1.2 billion over the forwards. We'd be investing every single dollar back into pharmacy programs. But, of course, we, we want to monitor that because I think I've said every occasion I've had the chance to as Health Minister, I want to see a thriving community pharmacy sector delivering more services, not just processing repeat scripts, but delivering more health services to their customers. Their customers had a wonderful experience in a really difficult few years through COVID because their pharmacy doors were always open. Um, talking to, to customers, if anything, their trust, their relationship with their pharmacist has grown over the course of COVID. And I think that's a great opportunity for us to broaden the work that pharmacists do. But, you know, I'm determined, if I'm given advice by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, advice that's been in place now for five years, of a way to halve the cost of medicines for six million Australians living with chronic disease, I'm going to take it up. And you, you're not quite right because... We didn't come into line with a number of other countries because a number of other countries, some of which you mentioned, I think, um, allow 90-day dispensing, not 60-day dispensing. So if anything, there are even more savings that are put in place in those other countries. That was a recommendation put to me by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. I didn't think that was appropriate to go with right now. I thought the proper balance was a 60-day dispensing arrangement, and I still think it's the right one. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Minister. We'll wrap up there. I want to thank you again for being here today, taking 15 questions or more when your voice is uh, showing the strains of the pre-budget period. I'd like to present you with complimentary membership to the National Press Club. Uh, you're welcome back here at any time. Thank you again for the address. Please thank our speaker.